Halo Infinite's technical test has come and gone, and while many of us are sad that, well, we can no longer play Halo Infinite, I took some time to kind of collect all my thoughts, and that way I could share with you guys kind of how I felt about the test, how I'm feeling about Halo Infinite, and kind of how I see it moving forward. So let's jump right in. So to try and make this video a little bit less hectic, I tried to kind of split things up into categories, so I'll try and kind of name out the categories as we're going through them, but there is a whole ton of stuff to talk about from this technical flight because we finally got to play Halo Infinite and a lot of stuff kind of overlaps or kind of fits into multiple categories so there will be a little bit of haziness to it but I tried to keep it as organized as I could for you. So first thing I kind of just want to talk about my general thoughts about the technical flight and about just Halo Infinite in general. Nothing too specific but I had a really really good time playing the technical flight. Now is that because I am just Halo star and I haven't played a new Halo in years or is it the fact that Halo Infinite actually feels and plays really well? That I'm not too sure about and I won't really know Know until I get to actually put more time into Halo Infinite as I really only got to put about 30 to 40 hours into the technical test just due to the fact that it was over a weekend and I had stupid real life stuff I had to do when I much rather would have probably been playing Halo. But besides that, long story short, Halo Infinite's technical test has made me very hopeful for the game itself. What we saw from this technical test made me believe in 343 and this game in a way that I honestly probably didn't before. Now, do not get me wrong. This test was not perfect. There were bugs, setting issues, visibility issues, performance issues, and basically every type of issue that you could imagine, but it was an old build and they were pretty straightforward that that is what we were gonna get. If you look past all that stuff though, what was there, the core gameplay, how how the game felt was really good and that is why I'm hopeful. I think that 343 might have actually nailed kind of modernizing what we would want from Halo without going full blown into the direction that Halo 5 went and I'm really really excited about this direction change as I didn't really want to see Halo 5 2.0. So one last thing I want to say just kind of about my general thoughts before we jump into the specifics is I want the takeaway to be from this that I am really hopeful for Halo Infinite however there are things to nitpick and to kind of talk about and so Throughout the rest of this video, it's going to be a lot of that because it's way easier to kind of point out the things that you didn't like or that you want to see improved as opposed to just me being like, oh, this was good, that was good, etc. So I don't want you guys to take away my opinion of this entire flight and everything as super negative when that isn't the case at all, but it might come across that way a little bit just as I point out the different flaws in the game and in the build itself. So just keep that in mind. And with that said, we'll hop into the specific issues that I had. And so let's start with the specific issues I had with the build itself. Now I understand this build was multiple months old and it is a technical test. This isn't a beta and 343 was very upfront that it was going to be buggy. But we have to be honest, even if this build is two months old, that is still a build that's only about four or five months out from launch. Now I'm not a developer. I don't know what kind of stuff can happen in the last four or five months of development, but there does seem to be a lot of stuff here that needs to be fixed changed or maybe even overhauled completely depending on what we're talking about. So some specific things that I had problems with in the flights were just a lot of the bugs. It seemed like almost every time that I closed the game or the game crashed, all of my key bindings and control settings completely reset until the last day when it stopped randomly doing that. So maybe they fixed it. I don't know. The build also crashed for me way more than I would want out of a new game. And that's not even talking about how hard it was to actually get into matches. People constantly crashed out. The loading screens were long. I was laughing on my stream talking with chat because they use that black screen with those three dots and it, it felt like at times you were playing the dot simulator because you were just staring at those dots. You didn't know if the game bugged out, if it was going to crash or if you just had to wait and sit through it. You kind of just sat there until eventually either it loaded in or you gave up depending on how long you were willing to wait. Once you got into the game though, like I said, I thought it felt pretty good, but the performance was absolutely abysmal. So I play on a PC with a 3080 Ti and a Ryzen 9 3900X. Not necessarily the top of the top of the line, but pretty far up there in terms of custom PC builds. And I couldn't even squeak out 100 FPS out of this game. Even when I turned all the settings down to low, I did the NVIDIA ultra low latency. I did Halo supports fix where I capped minimum at 30 FPS and I capped maximum at 144. It didn't matter. I couldn't consistently get over that 80 to 90 FPS mark. And while that isn't an atrocious frame rate, if you're playing on a high refresh, 
refresh rate monitor, that doesn't feel very good. When you spend this much money on a PC, you expect to be playing all games, including AAA games, over 144 FPS, especially if you're cranking all the settings down to low to try and maximize on your frames. And that's just in my case, with a very strong PC. I've seen cases where people on Xboxes were playing with 15 to 30 FPS. I've seen older PC builds that basically couldn't even play the game. This game needs a lot of optimization before it comes out, because if you release a PC game or even an Xbox game that runs this terribly and it's supposed to be a competitive shooter, people will bounce off that super quickly. Now, I don't know how easy optimization is to fix, but I am just going to not worry about it and just hope for the best. And if it comes out this unoptimized, then we'll need to talk about it more. But hopefully this has improved a lot before the next flight and definitely before the game releases in the holiday season of this year. So besides settings resetting, crashing, and the terrible performance, I also kind of just wanted to talk about the situation surrounding the flight itself. So the way that it worked out was we had a mostly bot only flight. And by that, I mean, you played four players versus four bots Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and then Sunday, except for two hours at the end of the night in North American time, roughly, I think it started around 9 p.m. for me and ended at 11 p.m., where you could actually play proper PvP. I won't complain about playing against bots for three or four days because I've kind of put my thoughts about that out there, but I will just say the bots left a lot to be desired. So on the first day, we had the Marine level bots, the second and third day was the ODST level bots, and then the last day was the Spartan bots, and then that little section of PvP at the end of the day. Day. Don't get me wrong, I really enjoyed experiencing Halo Infinite Sandbox and finally getting to play the game, but the bots put up zero challenge on all of the difficulties. And honestly, if someone hadn't told me they changed the difficulty on the last day, I probably wouldn't have even noticed other than it felt like the Spartan bots would occasionally do high level crouch strafes where they would just crouch and strafe as they were taking a gunfight with you and it would completely catch me off guard. But then the next 15 gunfights you would take with the Spartan level bots, they'd almost just stand there. So it was weird because because at times it seemed like the Spartan level bots or even the ODST level bots could actually be a formidable opponent. But then most of the time they kind of just seemed lost. They were running into walls. They were kind of just standing there getting shot. And so at the end of the day, I didn't have a single game where I felt like it was even in contention to possibly lose to the bot. Even when I was doing specific things to test out stuff and not necessarily try and win the game. And that was kind of a bummer for me. I understand that you would want the marine level bots to be easy, but I would hope as you up the difficulty, they would actually be a challenge even for veterans of the Halo franchise. But maybe I'm just misunderstanding what the bots were supposed to do. Hopefully 343 was able to get a lot of information on the bots because even against new Halo players, I think they need a lot of work. For example, at the start of every game, regardless of what difficulty the bots were on, they all seem to do the same thing on a map. So on live fire, they'd all come wrap around that first corner or on recharge, they always went for overshield or on bazaar. It seemed like there was always three or four of them standing right under the rocket spawn. And so you could just get really easy multi kills, which is fun for getting multi kills. But it's honestly pretty boring when the bots do the same exact thing every single game. And it's all four of them. They don't even split up. To kind of give you the illusion of doing different things. It's just four bots. <laughs> it's just four bots here every single game. And you play that for 20 or 30 hours and it starts to become pretty underwhelming. Besides that, the bots would do weird things where a lot of times you could take gunfights with them and win pretty comfortably. And then occasionally a bot would just absolutely laser you with a sidekick from pretty far away. And you'd just be kind of like, well, I don't know how I was going to beat that. But overall, like I said, the bots were very, very easy and very underwhelming in terms of competition. Obviously, bots aren't my primary concern for Halo Infinite in the future, but they were a primary focus of this technical test, so I felt like it's worth talking about. Next up, let's talk about the PvP. I absolutely loved playing the PvP, but we only got it properly for about two hours, which was kind of a bummer. And if you weren't in North America or in a North American time zone, you probably honestly missed the PvP. Or even if you were in North America, if you were Eastern time zone, it started toward the end of the night. So I know 343 wanted to make sure they hit all their parameters and everything before letting us test out the PvP. I think they could have done a little bit of a better job communicating or scheduling the PvP so that more of the player base could have experienced it. Like I said though, I really enjoyed the PvP and there is more I want to say about it later on when we're talking about different mechanics, but overall I loved the PvP. It felt really fun and I just can't wait to play more of it to kind of flesh out my opinion on it more because like I said, it really only lasted about two hours so it's hard to kind of get a full opinion on a game in just two hours. So that's kind of my thoughts on the build and just the situation surrounding the technical test. Now let's jump into specific Halo Infinite 
infinite related things. So first I want to kind of talk about mechanics and things like that. The first and foremost thing we have to talk about is sprint. Everybody loves Sprint, right? I actually think 343 nailed the way they did Sprint. So fellow Halo content creator Nade God actually did all the tests. And so Halo Infinite Sprint speed only increases your movement speed by 9%. I really like that because it doesn't make Sprint super fast. So you don't necessarily have to widen the map super far or anything like that. Another thing I want to talk about with Sprint in Halo Infinite is they have gone back to the system where your shields can fully regenerate while you're sprinting. Unlike in Halo 5, where if you were sprinting, your shields did not regenerate. I think in Halo Infinite, this works perfectly fine because the sprint speed is so slow as we just talked about a little bit earlier. So it's not like in Halo 4 or something like that, where people are going to be sprinting away and you're not going to be able to finish off kills and they're going to be able to get their shields back. Or even if you were playing Reach and that would happen, it doesn't really seem to be as much of an issue in Halo Infinite because people that are sprinting away from you aren't going to be able to get away nearly as easily as they were in some of the other Halo games that had sprint. Along with sprint, we also have the slide mechanic, which I know some people don't like, but I absolutely love slide. Not only does it just kind of feel natural to be able to slide when you're sprinting, the slide mechanic also unlocks a ton of cool movement tech that players were already starting to discover in the technical test and will only start to discover more as Halo Infinite comes out and players are able to really get their hands around it. Another one of those modern Halo mechanics per se was clamber. That's also in Halo Infinite. And I'll be honest with you guys, I understand why people don't like Clamber, but in Halo Infinite, it didn't bother me too much. Now, granted, we only got to play on three maps, and there definitely were jumps where you still have to clamber, but it felt like a lot of the more basic routes that you were taking were designed in mind to be able to do a crouch jump or to be able to kind of slide jump across a gap without having to clamber. Now, obviously, if you're trying to get somewhere high or something like that, you did have to clamber, but I didn't feel like I was constantly clambering all over the map to the point where it was a detriment to the flow of the gameplay. At the end of the day, would I prefer a game that didn't have Clamber? Maybe, but I really don't think it's going to be that detrimental to Halo Infinite, especially maybe for players more on the casual side, as it does definitely make traversing the map a little bit more approachable. So overall, I think those mechanics all feel really good in Halo Infinite. However, on the last day when we had that short PvP flight, I felt like the radar and the sprint in Halo Infinite really conflict. And what I mean by that is currently the way the radar works is you only show up on radar if you're using equipment, shooting, or sprinting. And while against the bots, that literally didn't matter because I don't even know if the bots used the radar and everyone just held forward and pushed the bots, in those PvP matches that were a lot slower and people were playing with a lot more purpose, they were holding portions of the map, I felt like a lot of times I was de-incentivized to use sprint because I didn't want to show up on the radar. Now, I'm not 100% sure if this is a bad thing. I just felt like the two mechanics kind of conflicted with each other. I think specifically for the social settings of Halo Infinite, they should either go with the standard Halo radar where everyone shows up if you're moving unless you're crouch walking or maybe they go away from the radar altogether even in social because settings like this I think work for kind of your high level your HCS playlist but I'm not really sure if they're all that good for social settings and 343 didn't necessarily confirm or deny whether the settings we were playing in this test were what they were looking at for social settings or if it was something for more on the competitive side. Another system I want to talk about in Halo Infinite is the way that D-scope works. So in every Halo game besides Halo 4, if you are using Smart Link or you're scoping in on a weapon, when you get shot, it kicks you out of that and then you can scope back in and then if you get shot, it kicks you back out. In Halo Infinite, it's weapon specific depending on the zoom level of that weapon. So the sidekick, the assault rifle, the needler, those types of weapons won't kick you out of the Smart Link when you're getting shot, while something like the battle rifle or the commando or the sniper or the skewer, you will get knocked out of your scope if you get shot while you're scoped in. I think this is kind of clunky and inconsistent. I understand why it's like that because it is based around the scope levels. So the further a weapon scopes, that's what determines if you're going to get descoped or not. But I feel like either all weapons should descope or none of the weapons should descope. I'm not a huge fan of this middle ground where they kind of just pick and choose weapons based off zoom level. And that's what determines if it's going to descope you or not. Although at the very least, there is one quality of life change that I'd like to see made if they're going to keep this system. And that is that in M MCC, if you're using toggle zoom, you can still hold the zoom button and if you let go, it'll unzoom you. 
in Halo Infinite, that is not an option. If you're using toggle, it's purely toggle. And if you're using hold, it's purely hold. So I'd like to see that kind of hybrid functionality where I can set it to toggle, but I can still choose to hold down on a sidekick or an AR and then let off of it when I'm done shooting rather than having to click the button again. It's not some huge deal or anything like that, but it's just a small quality of life change that I would like to see made if they're going to keep this system since they are employing basically two different versions of Halo's D scope mechanics from the franchise. You have Halo 4's model where there's no D scope, but then you also have the regular D scope from the rest of the games that functions just as it did in those games. So I'd like to see that hybrid functionality because we already see that today in MCC. So I see no reason why we wouldn't have that in Infinite. There are two other Halo Infinite specific mechanics I want to talk about that are kind of tangentially related. And that is the fact that in the technical test, there was no player collision and there was also no team damage. I really hope that both of these things are changed in the full release of the game or the next flights and this was maybe just a technical test thing because this really does change the way halo was played to a certain degree however if these were to be social settings or the casual settings i can live with that however ranked needs collision and it definitely needs team damage while not having collision is weird and it kind of takes away from some of the cool things you can do in halo with different boosts on your teammates and things like that it also makes gunfights kind of weird where if you're fighting someone they could be shooting at you fall back behind a corner and their teammate can instantly run through them and start shooting at you whereas in a previous halo game they would bump into each other and it would kind of be awkward but now there would be none of that awkward bumping so they could just kind of continue to shoot you. Another big detriment is without team damage. Your teammates can literally just YOLO push into your own grenades. You can rocket your own teammates. You can do all sorts of weird things that you cannot do in previous Halo games. So like I said, I would like to see those just changed whole cloth, but if they were to use these for social settings, I'll live with it. But ranked competitive Halo Infinite play needs player collision and it needs team damage. So I hope to see those changed in future flights or at least talked about in terms of what kind of settings we're playing on because 343 didn't really mention whether or not the settings we were playing were more of their social settings or more of their competitive settings, though I do imagine it was probably more of the social settings. Next up, I kind of want to talk about a new system in Halo Infinite, and that's the friend or foe system. So as you guys know, Halo Infinite got rid of red versus blue, and I'm totally okay with that. It is, it is definitely so they can sell you more cosmetics, but at the end of the day, I don't think it's the end of the world. I've never been attached to red versus blue in my game games or anything like that. And I don't mind seeing different Spartans colors and everything like that. Currently by default, your teammates are kind of highlighted in a blue color and your opponents are highlighted in a red color. Although you can change those colors to your liking. And for the most part, I thought this system worked pretty well. Although I do feel like there was occasions where an enemy would appear on my screen and not instantly get highlighted. And so I think that needs to get fixed or they need to do something where maybe my teammates have their service tag above their head because then it makes it really obvious. Obvious. If a Spartan has a service tag, he's my teammate. If he doesn't, that's an enemy. And then you can still have the highlights there to help people, but they don't have to be the sole indicator of whether it's a friend or foe. Also, not having the service tags actually, I think, is really, really detrimental to competitive play. It didn't matter at all when I was playing against the bots. But now, if you see your teammate in a certain spot on the map, there's no service tag. You don't know who that is unless you are just completely in touch with where everyone on your team is. Whereas in the past, if you're playing something like Halo 3 and maybe your teammate is at snipe on Guardian and you're top gold or something and you see someone lift over to them, you can say, yo, Billy, you're getting lifted on because you know it's Billy. But now you would just have to be like, yo, someone's lifting snipe. And so the call out's going to take a lot longer. It's going to be a lot more confusing. I really would like to see service tags come back, not only for the friend or foe system, but just for the clarity and call out as I think it makes it a lot better and more clear knowing which one of your specific teammates is where on the map. Another kind of mechanic in Halo Infinite, and this isn't Halo Infinite specific per se, but the melee range seems way too far. I felt like you could crank a melee from like a mile away and you would punch someone. So I would like to see that maybe lessened a little bit going forward. Spartans can also now punch. This is, <laughs> this is not a big deal and I'm not going to talk about it that much because I don't know how much I can get into some of the stuff that may or may not have been leaked. But 
I'll just say I think we might be seeing Spartans running around with fists, not only in custom games. Other than that, you also had the new AI companion system, and then you also had the Spartan chatter system, which I believe was in Halo 5, but don't quote me on that. I like that you can turn off the Spartan chatter system, and maybe someone can clarify if I'm wrong, but I'm not sure if you could turn off the AIs. If they include those settings where I can turn them off 100% for them, I think they're a cool option for people who want them, but I felt like the AI was telling me way too much stuff that I did not care about. It was kind of just constant noise in my ear that I just tuned out at some point. So I would like to be able to turn off the AI. I would like to be able to turn off the Spartan chatter and just kind of play the game or even turn off the AI, but maybe leave the Spartan chatter on because sometimes that information is a little bit more valuable. Other than that, you kind of had the HUD of Halo Infinite and I don't know if I like it. They definitely have gone with a more sleek approach where they've put most of the information down in the lower right corner. You have the nades, you have your weapon, your ammo count, your equipment, everything is down in that lower right corner. Your shields are still at the top and then the radar is down in the lower left. And that's pretty much it in terms of your heads up display, which is totally different from the prior Halo games, which would kind of use all corners of the screen to communicate different information to you. I like that it's more clear and sleek, but I do feel like we are losing a level of information there. So I wonder if there's some wiggle room there where maybe they can communicate a little bit more information to us, but they don't necessarily need to completely clutter up the screen. One thing that really comes to mind is grenades. In the past games, you could usually see exactly how many of each type of grenade you're holding. Whereas now in Halo Infinite, you just have the one grenade slot. And then if you wanna see what other grenades you're holding, you have to cycle over to them, which isn't the end of the world or anything like that. But I would just prefer to have two different slots because there's only two grenades you can hold anyways. So show me if I'm holding two frags and two spike grenades or two spike grenades and two plasmas and then kind of highlight which one's the active one that I would be throwing. In the settings, you could set specific keybinds for different equipment. So I wonder if in custom games or specific playlists, maybe you are going to be able to hoard multiple different types of equipment. And if you can, this UI is going to have the same problem there where all of the equipment is going to be jammed into that one slot and you'll kind of have to cycle through them all or remember which ones you've picked up. Although that's kind of speculation because because in the gameplay that we had, you could only hold one equipment or power up at a time. Speaking of power-ups, the power-up system has kind of completely been overhauled with the overshield and the invisibility to now where it basically acts as an equipment that you pick up and then you can pop it wherever you want. These power-ups are still on a static timer though, so you can almost completely play around something like an overshield where if you pick up an overshield and you don't have to pop it, you can then contest the next overshield with your overshield, which adds a layer of tactics and strategy to Halo, but also probably is going to end up pretty frustrating in sweaty PvP matches. But like I said, I didn't really have the opportunity to experience that because most of my technical test gameplay was shooting at bots. And most of the time you didn't even have to bother contesting the power ups because you were going to kill the bots anyways, and it didn't matter. So that's something I'm kind of keeping in the back of my head for the next flight to really see how that plays out when I'm playing matches against real people and I'm playing more of those matches against real opponents and sweatier opponents. One change I would like to see made though is maybe the option. So currently, if you're holding an equipment and you go to pick up a power up, you click your interact button, whatever it's on, and then you still have to activate the power up using your equipment button. I'd like to see an option where if you hold the interact, it just auto activates it to kind of minimize the time that you need there to kind of give that a quality of life update because there were situations where I was holding a drop shield or something like that that I didn't even care about and I would go to grab over shield but while grabbing over shield I'd have to click interact to drop the drop shield and then I'd pick up the over shield and then I needed to activate the over shield and that slight little bit of extra time that it took me to do that would end up getting me killed whereas if I could just hold to activate right away or if it would just activate on pickup like it did in previous games then I wouldn't have necessarily died there during the animation because the animation for these power-ups is pretty long. Another thing that I'm not a huge fan of about the UI is the metal system. Not only are the metals very small, they also all look really, really similar. So in previous games, if you're hitting cool clips or you're doing cool things, you get these big, colorful, vibrant metals kind of congratulating you for what you're doing. In Halo Infinite, you get these small little things over to the left of the screen that in a lot of cases are very similar in color. For example, all of the higher multi-kills, I think above overkill in Halo Infinite are all red. And that's kind of a bummer to me. I would love to see the return of the more classic metals. This isn't the end of the world or anything like that, but it is one of those things where I'm not totally sure why it needed to be changed. And I don't think that's me just being like a, oh, I hate change kind of person. I think this is more of a, 
We had a cool system with the different colors. It made it clear. It made it easy to know what metal you were getting at a quick glance. Whereas now you have to stare. Was that a kill tack? Was that a Kilimanjaro? They're all red. You basically have to count the stars inside the little tiny circle. And I'm not a fan of that. And last but not least in this section of the video, I just want to talk about the menu UI. I didn't really mess with it a ton. Like I didn't really go that much into the battle pass because honestly, I felt like it was bugged half the time and I really just wanted to play the game. I didn't care that much about the cosmetics, but overall the menu UI seems okay. And that's something I kind of want to focus on more in future flights. So we're kind of just going to shelf that for now and we'll re-examine that later on, especially when there's more content to choose from as this technical test literally only had the Academy or whatever multiplayer playlist they were running at the time. This next section of the video, I want to talk about the guns of Halo Infinite, which ones I like, which ones I think maybe need changes and which ones that I honestly dislike. So we'll start with the sidekick. This is honestly probably my favorite new weapon in Halo Infinite, which I didn't expect. The design of the sidekick is pretty boring and the sound's pretty boring, but I really like the faster firing pistol that still has killing power, but it isn't necessarily as strong and as versatile as Halo 5's Magnum. I feel like the sidekick definitely it can be your go-to option at times, but it's not like the Magnum in Halo 5 where it's going to be the only thing you want to use pretty much in all cases besides a power weapon. There's definitely still room to use the BR at longer ranges because the sidekick gets pretty ineffective outside of mid range, or if you're close on people, there's still definitely a reason to use an assault rifle or an automatic over the sidekick. So I really like the way the sidekick fits into the sandbox. Although I will say the time to kill on the sidekick is very short if you're able to hit your shots. Again, there wasn't very much PVP, so it's hard to know because the bots were terrible. So this is another one of those things where I'm just going to shelf it because I don't want to give too many opinions on specific weapon balance until I can actually get a lot of playtime playing against competent opponents and not just bots outside of the two hours of PVP I played where I feel like there was a whole kind of meta game there and people were all brand new to PVP in Halo Infinite. So you don't really want to balance your game based on those two hours. Next up, we have the assault rifle. The assault rifle in Halo Infinite might be the strongest assault rifle we've ever had. It is very strong. It's strong close, it's strong mid-range, and it's even not atrocious at further ranges, especially if you're shooting with your teammates that also have assault rifles. And I feel that is something that we saw in the brief stint of PvP that was played. Now, I'm not recommending you use your AR at all times, but I am worried it may be a little bit too effective at mid-range and further than it should be. So that might be something we wanna keep an eye on in the next flight. One thing that I had in mind that could kind of reduce the effective range the assault rifle without having to necessarily nerf the damage or the range would be maybe to get rid of the smart link altogether on it. Although I don't see 343 doing that because they seem to be very fond of every single weapon having a scope or a smart link other than the heat wave, which is the one exception in Halo Infinite besides something like the hammer, which off the top of my head, I can't remember if you could zoom that in or not. Next up is the battle rifle. I really liked the way the battle rifle feels and against the bots, I absolutely loved it, but I will say I am going to keep my eyes out for how it plays in the next flight with PVP. It seems very strong in setups in a PVP match where maybe you have the BR and you're holding a power point that lets you take longer gunfights, but at medium and close range, the time to kill of the BR is completely outclassed by someone with a sidekick or an assault rifle or even the commando in terms of time to kill. So I just want to keep my eyes open and see how the battle rifle plays out once we get to play more PVP. But from what I saw in the brief stint of PVP is it was still very viable. But like I said, I'm just going to keep my eyes open on that and we'll kind of wait and see. Next up is the commando. This is another weapon that kind of has a more boring design and doesn't sound the coolest per se, but the commando is very, very strong if you're able to hit your shots. And so I am a little bit worried about how good the commando is going to be, especially for mouse and keyboard players that have really, really cracked aim. Because if you're able to take someone out mid or longer range using the hip fire on the commando where there isn't very much recoil, whether it's full autoing them down or bursting them to some degree, you can kill them very, very quickly if you hit those shots. And so I wasn't really seeing that happen too much in PvP, but like I said, every single time so far, we only had two hours, so it's kind of hard to judge balance. And against the bots, I mean, you could kill the bots with whatever you wanted. It didn't really matter. And the bots didn't really kill you with anything. So it's hard to tell. Next up, we have the sniper rifle. I really like how the sniper rifle looks and how it sounds. And I hate everything else about it. 
I don't know what it is, but the sniper rifle felt absolutely terrible on mouse and keyboard for me, and I saw a ton of people saying it felt pretty bad for them on controller. And I don't know why, because even in MCC, in a game where at times I don't love the way mouse and keyboard feels, the snipers in that game feel perfectly fine on mouse and keyboard, especially no scoping. However, in Halo Infinite, and I did see some tests online, it seems they almost added a layer of inaccuracy to no scoping, maybe to combat mouse and keyboard, which I'm a little confused by because in MCC and pretty much all the games outside of CE, which kind of is in its own ballpark and kind of H2C to the same degree, the sniper feels fine, especially if you're no scoping. However, in Halo Infinite, I felt like I couldn't hit anything even when I was no scoping. So I don't know if there was a layer of input delay there or maybe it was just the lower frame rates that I was experiencing, but I was really struggling to hit shots with the sniper. The next weapon I want to talk about is the gravity hammer. The gravity hammer, again, it looks cool and for the most part it sounds cool. I'm not sure if I'm a fan of how long it takes to swing. So in Halo 3, the gravity hammer to a degree kind of acts like the sword. It does have the gravity functionality, so it is definitely different, and you can swing outside of when your crosshair turns red. But if you wait to when the crosshair turns red, it'll basically lunge you at them and hit them, pretty much killing them unless something weird happens or they somehow get out of the way or get behind a wall or something like that. In Halo Infinite, you can swing it whenever you want, and it does this wind up and then you smack it down, but the catch is that there's no longer any lunge. And so now it definitely has a longer range of effectiveness, but without that lunge, you have to make sure that the enemy you're trying to hit stays in the center of your vision throughout the windup of the animation. This does offer a level of counterplay that wasn't there before in terms of the melee weapons in the Halo franchise, but it also at times makes the gravity hammer feel kind of weird and slow, and I wouldn't be opposed to the animation speed being sped up a little bit. The next weapon I want to talk about is the skewer. So we saw the skewer on live fire, and honestly, the skewer seemed pretty meh. It was just kind of a crappier sniper rifle. However, huge caveat, I think the skewer is mostly going to be a gun for BTB or maps with vehicles, which we did not get in this technical test. So I'm going to hold judgment on the skewer, but in the technical test, it just kind of felt meh. It shot harpoons at people basically, and it was just a projectile sniper rifle that was a one hit, but in most cases was just kind of worse than the sniper rifle. The Ravager is the next weapon up that I want to talk about, and I love the Ravager. The Ravager's design and everything thing is so cool. You have the regular fire where it kind of shoots these bursts of energy or flame. I'm not totally sure at the enemy. And depending on whether you direct hit them or where you direct hit them, you can like two or three burst someone with it. But if you hit next to them, maybe it takes like three or four. And so I really liked the versatility of the Ravager where you could go for those direct hits or you could kind of shoot at the ground and splash damage people also. There was also the alt fire, which I thought was really, really cool. And then it just didn't work for most of the technical tests. So if you didn't know on the Ravager, you could charge up the shot and shoot it, and it would kind of set the ground on fire, doing damage to anyone standing in the fire. However, it seemed after the first day that just stopped working. But I am very intrigued by the Ravager, and I can't wait to see more of it in the future, especially in a PvP setting where people kind of use it as an area of denial to hold people off from a power weapon or a power up that's about to spawn. Where if you know where if the overshield or a power weapon's up in five seconds, you shoot the fire right down in front of it between where the enemy and the power up or the power weapon is and now you have a huge advantage because they have to run through fire if they want to try and snag it but maybe you can sneak up and grab it without having to go through that fire so i think there's going to be a lot of cool plays we see with the ravager not just with the regular burst fire which i thought was cool and effective but also the alt fire with that area denial mechanic and the damage over time next up is the heat wave this is actually a weapon that at first i was not a big fan of and i thought was kind of dog but as i used it more i became a a huge fan of the heat wave and there actually was some really cool plays that I saw being made in the little bit of PvP that I played. So if you guys didn't use the heat wave, it's kind of a pseudo scatter shot to some degree. However, it has two forms of firing. You have the horizontal, which shoots out a big line, and then you have the vertical fire, which shoots out a vertical line. If you use the vertical, you can kill people really, really quick. However, it's pretty hard to hit them. And the alternative to that is if you use the horizontal, it's going to take multiple shots to kill someone, but it's very very easy to hit them. And so there's a lot of decision there, what kind of shot you want to go for. And that doesn't even include all the cool stuff that you can do with the ricochet of the heat wave. And so one specific thing that I remember is I was kind of over by that nest area on live fire. And there was an enemy that was just kind of pinning us down with heat wave shots. 
as he bounced them off the wall and they were kind of pinging us and they weren't doing a ton of damage but they were kind of holding us there and then quickly his teammate kind of pushed around the other side and we got pinched and we died and I thought that was really cool and I think the heat wave is going to be able to facilitate cool plays like that using the ricochet functionality on top of just being a cool weapon with the horizontal and vertical shots because the horizontal shot definitely was still very effective you could two shot someone or three shot someone or shoot someone and punch them in some scenarios and it kind of just all depended on how much health that person had but it wasn't by any means useless like I originally thought next up kind of still in the shotgun category was the bulldog the bulldog is pretty bland and boring like some of the other new UNSC weapons and it reminds me a lot of the judge from Valorant or the Eva from Apex where it's that drum style shotgun I'm not a gun person so if that's not the right terminology sue me I guess but you know what I mean it has that look it has that big circular thing that feeds ammo into the shotgun and you shoot people with it the bulldog is definitely a downgrade in terms of damage over previous shotguns but it does have a bit more range and shoots a little bit faster so the trade-off is you can no longer one shot someone with the bulldog unless they're already damaged but you can shoot multiple shots and kill someone pretty quickly and so while at first again I thought the bulldog was pretty bad as I used it more I realized it definitely has its cases where it's very useful. I felt like I got a lot of good use for it on Bazaar where there were a lot of closer range, close mid-range scenarios that I was getting into where I was definitely glad that I had the Bulldog. Now, is this because I was fighting bots who don't know how to shoot back or is it because the Bulldog is actually useful? I don't know. Wait and see. Next up, we have the plasma pistol. So I saw the Vengeful Vadam talking on Twitter and I didn't realize this during the flight, but if you use the regular fire of the plasma pistol where you don't charge it, it actually takes more shots with the plasma pistol than the sidekick to break shield. That's stupid and that needs to be fixed. The other main functionality of the plasma pistol is the charge shot, which I feel like is primarily what I've used the plasma pistol for, at least in the recent games of the Halo franchise. And so in specifically multiplayer, which which is what I've been talking about this whole time. We're not talking about campaign because the weapons might function completely different in campaign anyways. In multiplayer, the charge shot obviously takes someone's shields completely off and then you can finish them off with whatever weapon you have, whether it's a sidekick, a battle rifle, or even an assault rifle or a commando in this case, as now all those weapons have headshot modifier damage. The plasma pistol both feels too strong and too weak at the same time. The charge shot does not have very much tracking, but what I noticed, and granted I was shooting bots most of the time, but if you're able to hit them, it's a free kill. It's been a free kill in the past, but at the very least you had to pull out a battle rifle or in Halo 5's case you had to pull out the Magnum, which would take a little bit of time. However, in Halo Infinite you can pull out the sidekick, which is super quick and you can instantly shoot and take someone out. And if you miss the first shot, the sidekick shoots so fast and has such a high rate of fire, you can shoot off probably two or three shots before something in the past where you could even pull out your BR and start to shoot a burst. So I'm definitely interested to see how this one plays out because because if it turns out that players are able to kind of master that plasma pistol arc and consistently hit those shots, I think the plasma pistol combined with the sidekick is going to be very, very strong. Along the same lines with the plasma weapons is the pulse carbine, which I don't know if it's replacing the plasma rifle, but in this technical test, it was the only quote unquote plasma rifle style weapon. And so this is a carbine that shoots bursts of plasma damage that kind of have a slower projectile speed and they track a little bit and then depending on if you headshot the enemy it would take two bursts and if you body shot them it would take three. I am leaning more toward the pulse carbine kind of being pretty weak. It can melt shields pretty quickly but I felt like with the slower projectile speed the tracking just wasn't there enough to consistently hit those shots and I felt like a lot of the times especially in PvP which I didn't get to use it very much I would have just been better off using a different weapon to break shields or to kill them and so I'm not necessarily 100% sure where this one's supposed to fit in the sandbox but definitely something I want to use more of in the next flight and hopefully get a lot more playtime with it in PvP. Lastly in the weapon category I think unless I forgot something is the rocket launcher. The rocket launcher is a rocket launcher. I don't really have much to say. It functions like a rocket launcher. It seemed exactly like I would expect out of a rocket launcher and so it's fun. You can make really fun plays with some of the equipment like the grapple shot, but you can do that with all the weapons. So you're going to be able to make some cool plays with the rocket launcher, but that's nothing you can't do with some of the other weapons anyways, in terms of kind of swinging up into the air and killing people. So rockets seem fine to me. 
I don't really have too much to say on it. Before we move on to the next category, although maybe you could say this is part of the next category, but I want to talk about grenades. You spawn with two frag grenades and then you can hold one other type of grenade, whether it's a plasma grenade or a spike grenade, and you can hold two of whichever one of those you're holding. I feel like the grenades in all cases are too strong and the game felt way too grenade spammy. Even against the bots, I felt like the bots spammed grenades at you, but at first I just thought like, oh, it's just the bots. They're just being dumb, doing bot things because really it wasn't that detrimental to the game. Occasionally you'd get grenaded. But in the little bit of PvP that I was able to play, I felt like I was constantly being grenaded out of spots and it just felt like grenades were flying all over the place. It seemed like their effective area of damage is pretty strong. And so I think I want to see the grenades maybe toned down a bit. But just like I've been saying this whole time, kind of wait and see on that. Probably need a little bit more game time to determine that for sure. So now that we've kind of talked about all the weapons, let me just briefly talk about the system that technical test used and that was basically every map had multiple different weapon layouts that were dynamic and when you spawned into the game it would show you which power weapons which precision weapons which nades which shotgun etc was all going to be on the map and it varied game to game someone told me that 343 somewhere said that this was just a technical test thing since they don't have the full sandbox in the game and this was just to let players play with more weapons and everything like that if that's the case no issues with it at all that's totally fine however if they were to use this kind of dynamic spawn as a social setting I would maybe be okay with it though I do just kind of prefer knowing what map has what weapons and stuff like that before I even get into the game but at the very least ranked I think needs set spawns so we'll kind of just see how that plays out in the future lastly and I don't know if I just said lastly but lastly again is the starting layouts for Halo Infinite in the technical test it was sidekick AR and so obviously a lot of people in the Halo community prefer BR starts and while I actually thought AR sidekick starts played out pretty well I wouldn't mind mind maybe in the next flight especially if it's going to be more pvp focused to have br ar spawns or br sidekick spawns along with having the ar sidekick spawns and it could kind of switch off back and forth so that way you could get a feel for both sets of weapons and we could kind of go from there and see what plays best my guess would be 343 probably is leaning towards sidekick ar as that was kind of the trend in halo infinite to get away from br spawns and honestly i'm kind of okay with that i thought the sidekick was a lot of fun to use and while i love the Halo Infinite Battle Rifle, as long as it's still on the map and it has a point in the game, I don't mind not spawning with it as long as I have a viable precision weapon. And I think the sidekick fills that role. Unlike in a game like Halo 3, where if you're playing AR Star, it's AR and the Magnum and the Magnum in Halo 3 was pretty poop. Just like a lot of the points, we'll kind of see how this one plays out in the future and we can kind of see where it goes from here. All right, next up, let's move to the equipment. So there was three main equipment pieces, again, unless I'm forgetting something that was in the technical test that was the drop shield the target locator and the grapple shot and then obviously the power-ups that we talked about earlier with the invis and the overshield so we talked about kind of how using the invis and the overshield works i don't really have too much more to say on that other than the effective time that the power-up actually lasts i'm pretty sure has been lowered a significant amount probably to account for the fact that you can now use it wherever you want i think that's a fair trade-off that doesn't bother me because like i said you can kind of now use an overshield to contest an overshield or you can hold on to an overshield shield to contest a power weapon that's at a different time. So I think there's going to be a lot of strategy and tactics kind of based around holding power ups. And at first, while I was really, really worried about that, it seems to be okay because there is a visual indicator if someone's holding a power up. However, and I should have mentioned this in the earlier specific Halo Infinite section, the shields in this game need a rework. Although 343 has said they are already working on this, it's very hard to tell if someone has no shields, low shields, full shields or even an over shield a lot of times i would be shooting someone and they would end up crapping on me and then i would realize oh they had over shield or i would be shooting someone and i had no clue that they were one shot but 343 did confirm they are already aware of this and they are already looking at it so nothing too much to gripe about other than that my favorite equipment by far is the grapple shot we're gonna see so much cool stuff come out of the grapple shot and the fact that it's an equipment and is only on specific maps that 343 has tuned it for i love it 
I love it so much. I think the grapple shot would have been very detrimental to Halo if it was just a default ability, like a Halo 5 ability, but the fact that it's an equipment and you can take it off the map if it's breaking the map, you could probably even reduce the charges on certain maps because currently by default it gives you three charges, or you could even increase the respawn timer on the grapple shot on different maps to kind of balance it based on the map. So I'm really pleased with the way that they've handled the equipment and specifically in this case the grapple shot. But it's also just a ton of fun to use. You can do those ridiculous swings and while I didn't necessarily get to hit too many of those, once we have more of the ability to practice those slingshots and flying across the map, the grapple shot is going to be so much fun and it opens up so many possibilities for really, really cool plays. Next up, we have the target locator. So the target locator just allows you to shoot like a little dart and the dart kind of pings off and if it hits an enemy, it'll give you wall hack and you can see them and you can see their little name. It's fine. There was some cool tech with it. You can like stick it to a grenade, which I thought was pretty nifty. I don't really know how useful that is, but the target locator is fine. It's kind of just a meh equipment to me. I'm sure it will at times probably frustrate me when I get pinged by the target locator and get crapped on, but overall it's not too special to me and it, I don't love it. I don't really hate it either. Kind of wait and see. Hopefully some of the other equipment is a little bit more enjoyable and fun to play with than the target locator. Lastly, for the equipment in the technical test, we had the drop shield. This thing sucks. It takes way too long to throw out and it gets popped super quick. So the animation to throw it out and for it to activate takes forever. And then it literally only takes two shots from a sidekick to pop one of the little rectangles or if you're playing a real person and not a bot if you shoot the base it just pops the whole thing so i think either it needs to take more damage or it needs to activate a lot quicker i would like to see one of those changes tested hopefully in the next flight because the way it is now i really felt like there wasn't much incentive to use them unless you were just like pre-placing them to kind of like peek out in a corner which is something we did see a little bit in the technical preview from the 343 footage but it doesn't really have any of the same function of like the bubble shield from Halo 3 where you would use it to get out of a jam. The drop shield much more calculated and you kind of have to have a plan like I'm going to throw it here and I'm going to peek this corner with my drop shield because if you peek the corner and someone's there you can't drop the drop shield. You have to fight that person because if you try and drop the drop shield in the middle of the gunfight you're just going to lose the gunfight. And so I wouldn't mind seeing some changes there to the drop shield. So that's pretty much it for the equipment. Overall like I said huge fan of the way that the equipment is implemented in Halo Infinite. I don't necessarily necessarily love two out of the three actual pieces of equipment that we saw, but I really, really like the flexibility that the equipment system is going to have. And I'm really excited to see kind of how this evolves, not only at launch when I'm sure we're going to have more equipment than what we've seen, but also throughout its lifespan when they've mentioned that we might still get new equipment in the future. So I think it'll be really cool. It'll also make different maps play totally different because you can have totally different setups of equipment on all the different maps. So there's really a lot of possibilities with equipment. Equipment is so so much, so much better, so much better than just default abilities on your Spartan. And so I'm really, really excited to see where 343 takes the equipment system even though right now I really only actually like one of the pieces of equipment. All right, next up, let's move to the maps. This video is kind of dragging along, so I'll try and be a little bit quicker, but there's three maps that we got to play, Live Fire, Recharge, and Bazaar. And so out of the three, my favorite map is probably Bazaar. My least favorite map is definitely Live Fire. And then Recharge kind of falls somewhere in between. I think in terms of aesthetic, Recharge is a cooler map than Bazaar, as Bazaar kind of just feels like a map out of any modern military sim shooter or really anything in that genre. You know, you could see a Bazaar map in Counter-Strike or a Call of Duty or something like that. That's not the end of the world to me. The map is a lot of fun and it played pretty well for Slayer, but I am really excited to see how Bazaar is going to play out for different objectives game mode. And I do feel that Bazaar is going to be a pretty good competitive map and it has the grapple shot on it and I love the grapple shot. Recharge was the next map. I really like the aesthetic of Recharge. I think the whole power station system aesthetic is really cool if that's what it is. I, I'm not 100% sure. It looks really cool. It has a grapple shot. You know I like the grapple shot. It feels a little bit more unbalanced than Bazaar, but for social play, I think Recharge is going to be really good, and I'll be interested to see how it plays out for different competitive game modes. It's probably an okay Slayer map, maybe a Strongholds map, 
but it is asymmetrical so you're probably not going to see a ctf or something like that though maybe you could see an oddball there's a whole ton of fun things you can do with the gravity hammer spawn on recharge whether you grapple shot it from your teammate or you combat evolve it where you throw a nade over there and it bounces over to you lots of cool tech over there and i'm sure you guys saw a shit ton of clips from that section of the map because there was all sorts of funny stuff going down i won't lie i have definitely fallen off that part of the map more than i would like to admit lastly let's talk about live fire live fire is without a doubt my least favorite map out of the technical test and the fact that they opened with it and i had to play against nothing but marine bots on it for the entire first day and mostly into the second day definitely didn't help my opinion of live fire but this is kind of where i stand on it live fire is an asymmetrical map that i think is going to be a decent competitive map. However, it is very bland in terms of Halo aesthetic. It is very safe in terms of Halo map design or just FPS map design in general. If you threw this into a Call of Duty or you threw this into X Defiant that comes out sometime this year or basically any other FPS game that comes out in the next two to three years, I could see Live Fire being in that game. It just feels like FPS map the map. However, I don't think that's bad. If your whole map pool is maps like Live Fire, I think that becomes detrimental. But if Live Fire can complement much stronger maps and kind of just fit into the middle of the map pool, I have no problem with it. Like I said, my opinion was especially hurt on it because I had to replay it over and over and over against the really crappy bots that did absolutely nothing. So that definitely didn't help my opinion of it. But overall, it just feels like a bland and safe map. This next section, I want to talk about mouse and keyboard versus controller. Everyone's favorite Halo debate. But I'm also going to wrap esports into it because 343 came out and said that all Halo Infinite HCS tournaments, at least unless they change this, are going to be completely input open. And what I mean by that is you can play on a controller, you can play on a mouse and keyboard, and you're all going to be playing in the same tournament. I absolutely love that decision. I think that's huge for Halo Infinite's eSports, as now mouse and keyboard players have an incentive to play the game. If they weren't going to be allowed to compete in the highest level of Halo, I think a lot of them wouldn't have even bothered playing the game. So having it be free to play and be input agnostic, if that's the right use of that word, is awesome. I'm a big fan. However, I think it's very, very weird that 343 and the eSport committee, whatever their name is, has it set up so that in the tournaments for millions of dollars, you can play controller versus mouse and keyboard, but you can't play controller versus mouse and keyboard in ranked baffles me. Makes no sense. If they did a system where you could opt in and out, totally a fan. But currently the way they've explained it is it's forced input based matchmaking and that's it. I think that's a bummer. I hope to see that changed, especially with the news that the competitive esports scene allows all the different inputs. I thought if anything, the HCS was going to be controller only with kind of the vibe I was getting from that prior decision. But when they went with you being able to use any input method, it's very weird to me that ranked is still going to be forced input based matchmaking. Maybe they've changed their mind, but they haven't touched on it since that blog, however many months ago. Don't get me wrong. Matchmaking isn't necessarily where you're going to get your peak practice for a tournament. But if you're a controller player or you're a mouse and keyboard player that wants to be a competitive player, you're going to play a lot of matchmaking, not only to kind of see how you match up with different people, but you're also going to want to grind the ladder. You're going to want to hit the high levels of champion. You're going to want to play against top AMs and top pros, maybe kind of beat them in some matchmaking matches, make a name for yourself, get invited into eights lobbies, maybe get on a team, play scrims, etc. But it's going to be hard to do that if all the mouse and keyboard players are playing against nothing but mouse and keyboard players and all the controller players are playing against nothing but controller players. It also makes it hard to tell, is that mouse and keyboard player any good or is he just good because he's playing nothing but other mouse and keyboard players? Same with controller players. So I think the HCS and the ranked system needs to line up. That's basically my opinion on that. I did see a tweet from a certain pro, and I'm not going to go too deep into this, where he basically threw a hissy fit that he has to play against mouse and keyboards in Halo Infinite competitive, but then he also admitted that controllers are better for Halo. So I don't know what he was going for there. And I think it's really, really sad to see prominent, popular Halo professional players throwing a fit about having to be inclusive and allow other inputs that are only going to grow the eSport. More players are going to want to play Halo Infinite and more players that play on mouse and keyboard are going to care about the eSport and are going to watch it. I do still think probably controller will be the dominant input method for 
high competitive play, but it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. And I think it'll be fun to watch how these players kind of match up against each other when they go head to head. One thing that's really, really weird for me though, is that all of the HCS tournaments are going to be open tournaments, which is awesome. However, one weird thing that they said in their blog post was that if you were coming through the open bracket, you have to play on a Xbox Series X which is going to be capped at 120 FPS, as opposed to a PC, which could have 240 FPS on a 240 Hertz monitor. And so this will be something where I, I just have to wait and see. But I think that's detrimental to mouse and keyboard players that are trying to come through open bracket. Because if you know anything about how aiming works with mouse and keyboard, you basically want to play at the highest frame rate possible on the highest refresh rate monitor possible, because it just makes your mouse aim and movement more smooth and more consistent. This is still true with a controller, a higher refresh rate and a higher frame rate is going to allow you to aim more consistently with a controller but i would argue that controller players can more easily adjust to lower frame rates however like i said up in the air i'll have to kind of wait and see how that plays out i'm also not a pro player so my opinion on that might be completely irrelevant and we can ignore it overall though how do i actually feel about mouse and keyboard versus controller in halo infinite i don't know I saw tons of people saying controller feels bad and has heavy aim. I didn't like how mouse and keyboard felt, but I also couldn't get the game to run at a decent frame rate. So I'm basically going to chalk this technical test and we'll wait for the next flight and I'll see how mouse and keyboard versus controller plays there and we'll go from there. And that's basically it, guys. That is kind of my thoughts on basically everything Halo Infinite and everything technical test. I'm sure I forgot some stuff. I tried to write everything down beforehand so I wouldn't, but... If I did, let me know in the comments, let me know what I forgot, and uh, I'll tell you I'm sorry. Overall, like I said, this technical test, while it definitely had issues, has made me hopeful. Halo Infinite at its core seems like a good game, and I had a lot of fun playing. I'm excited to see where it goes in the future, and that's basically where I'm at. I don't necessarily know, is the game going to be any good? Who knows? We only played three maps, mostly against some bots. So maybe the time the next flight rolls around or once the game finally comes out, that's when we'll know for sure. But right now I'm leaning toward 343 might have done it. They might have made a good Halo game. We'll wait and see. That's totally up in the air though. What would I like to see from the next test? I would like to see BTB. We didn't see any BTB and that's supposed to be a key component of this game. I also don't want to test bots again. So I would really like to see PVP the whole time next time around. And so that's basically what I want to see from the next test. I'd also like the build to be more optimized so we can see how Halo Infinite feels on proper frame rates to kind of get our opinions more fleshed out and everything like that. But besides that, I just want them to announce the next set of flights or just kind of tell us what's going on next. I really hope that we don't sit around waiting another month or so before we hear anything again. Hopefully they just let us know straight up when they're aiming for the next flight or whatever their plans are going forward and we can kind of go from there. Anyways guys that is going to do it for the video. I hope you enjoyed it. I know that was a long beast of a video but I wanted to talk about Halo Infinite. We haven't had a new Halo game in a long time. So there's a lot to talk about and there's going to be a lot more to talk about hopefully in the future. Let me know in the comments below how you felt about the technical test, how you're feeling about Halo Infinite and what you'd like to see in the near future from 343. With that said, guys, follow me over on Twitch. I've streamed Tuesdays, Thursdays, Saturdays. I don't know what I'll be streaming in the near future because going back to MCC is going to be a pain, but I will still definitely be streaming some Halo here and there. Other than that, follow me over on Twitter, follow me over on Instagram, and hopefully Halo Infinite comes out soon because I want to play more of this game. With that said, I'll see you all next time.